So hello and welcome everyone to the first of the eight part seminar series. Um, this series uh, will comprise of eight different parts and each uh, session will focus on a specific development area and ultimately will serve as an input into a keynote presentation on Africa's integrated development prospects for the second and the third 10-year implementation plan of Agenda 2063. These sessions and, and, and the outcomes of this will culminate into a think tank inception conference that will be held from the 26th to the 28th of September in Addis Ababa. So this session is just meant to be 60 minute session. And I'd like to refer to this as the Goldilocks session where we not too much and not too little, but just enough to steer your interest. And we aim to provide a bandwidth of information and knowledge acquisition. So wherever you are today, we are excited to get content delivered to you. And we consider this as the MacGyver approach to solving problems towards Africa's integrated development prospects. Um, when you look back, foresight is actually an old practice. However, it is more recently referred to as a development, developed science that involves innovation and informed ways of thinking about the future in an attempt to design possible scenarios or visions to strategically plan for action towards desirable futures or to um, uh, mitigate unpleasant circumstances. So foresight and future studies have been used in both private and public sectors since the mid 1940s. The African Union Development Agency's Policy Bridge Tank Program seeks to actively integrate the knowledge content generated by our think tanks for evidence-informed policy making. And therefore we have partnered with the Africa Futures and Innovations Program of the Institute for Security Studies, who are specialists in providing meaningful contributions through Africa's broader economic transformation. And in order to support national regional development plans and processes, the African Futures and Innovation Program brings foresight analysis, which integrates the international futures modeling platform which serves to analyze complexity and long-term dynamics of change in human, social, and natural systems. The aim today is to share with policymakers, academics, the private sector, international organizations, and multilateral agencies, and others seeking to improve the way we contemplate and plan for global future. So we are delighted that you have joined us today and we look forward to a fruitful and engaging dialogue. With this, I would like to take this opportunity of introducing you to Dr. Jackie Salias, who is the head of the African Futures and Innovations Program of the Institute of Security Studies, who will present Africa's population future and the impact of a more rapid demographic transition and investments in health on development outcomes. Uh, we count on all our participants to interrogate, question, and comment on what you hear. As Dr. Jackie Siliers is an expert on this model, he is the form, founder and former executive director of the Institute for Security Studies. He currently serves as the chair of the ISS Board of Trustees and head of the African Futures and Innovations Program in South Africa, Pretoria. Uh, in 1917, Jackie's best seller, Fate of Nations, addresses South Africa's futures from political, economic, and social perspectives. His most recent three books, which is named Africa First, Igniting a Growth Revolution, the second book being The Future of Africa, Challenges and Opportunities, the third, Africa Tomorrow, Pathways and Prosperity, which all critically addresses the impact to promote further progress towards the attainment and goals and objectives of both the 2030 and the 2063 agenda. With that, Jackie Siliers, I, I, I welcome you and, and it's over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Pamela. That's a very uh, impressive introduction uh, and I'm pleased and honored to be part of this uh, seminar series. So 
Um, during uh, last year, we launched uh, um, a very large website. It was launched by the uh, President of South Africa, uh, President His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa, and the CEO of Order Nepad, um, in about June of last year. And I'm going to be presenting from uh, from that website. I will in the in the chat function. I will just uh, share a link to the website. I'm going to go to the um, front page of the website, and um, yeah, I'm going to um, show you uh, a few things about um, uh, the firstly with a seminar series, and then um, a look at where we are headed. So um, hopefully you can all see uh, the front page of the website with the logo yes, of Order Nepad on it. Yes, we can. Thanks very much, Pamela. So in this seminar series, uh, we are going to be looking at, um, if I go to the top, the thematic portion of the website, we are going to be taking um, each of eight sectoral scenarios and examining them within the context of their contribution to the Agenda 2063 long-term vision of Africa. In this event, we are starting with demographics. And I'm going to go shortly to the demographics portion of the website, but we will every week be taking one of these themes, agriculture, health wash, education, manufacturing, the full implementation of the continental free trade area, leapfrogging, financial flows and large infrastructure, and we will do governance last. And then we combine these sectoral scenarios in a combined Agenda 2063 scenario and that is what Pamela was referring to, what we are going to present in an updated, amended form um, at our joint conference with Order Nepad in Addis Ababa in September of this, this year. So each of these sectors build on the other. Um, we, um, and in each of these, we are going to compare where Africa is headed in that sector, in this case, population, uh, with what we refer to as the current path. The current path is Africa's ongoing trajectory of development. It's where we think Africa is headed. And then we ask the question, what contribution can a more rapid demographic transition make to Africa's growth prospects? We all know the story of Africa's rapid population growth. It's a very large youth uh, full population and so on. I'm not going to repeat that. I'm going to speak primarily about the relationship between democracy and economic growth, in particularly income growth. So um, our forecast horizon on this platform and going forward is to the end of the third 10-year implementation plan of Agenda 2063. Uh, in other words, that is to 2043. Um, so Agenda 2063 st was started in 2013, 2023, 33, 43, 53, 63, we look out two decades uh, into the future. So if we then go to the, um, I'm, I'm, I'm first going to, let me first go, yeah, let's, let's go to the demographics uh, um, section of the website. I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to look at um, all the charts on the website. I'm going to give you a what we consider to be a conceptualization of the demographic dividend. So the demographic dividend is nothing else but the relationship of children below zero and 14 and elderly to the working age population. So it is the relationship of your dependents to your working age population aged 15 to 64. And that ratio in our view has, um, if that is a positive ratio, it makes a uh, contribution to uh, economic growth. And why do we say so? Let me show you a, um, how um, the um, population distribution of two countries in Africa. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the country, Mauritius, that in 2019 had the most mature population structure in Africa. This is a standard population pyramid, children at the bottom, um, male and female, uh, females on the left, males on the right. This is your age cohort. 
And on the right hand side, you will find the um, African population uh, pyramid for Niger, which is the country with the youngest population. I think the uh, median age in, uh, in Niger is around 17. So a country enters a favorable demographic dividend when the ratio of working age people 65 um, to above uh, 15 is positive. When that ratio gets to 1.7 uh, to every one dependent, 1.7 working age person, 15 to 64 to every dependent, you enter a positive demographic dividend because at that point, labor contributes to economic growth. Remember that there are three factors that basically contribute to economic growth, labor, capital, and technology. At low levels of development, and Africa has 23 low income countries and 23 low middle income countries, 46 out of our 54 countries, therefore, um, are uh, at the lower end of development. Labor makes the largest contribution to growth. As countries grow, capital becomes more important. And eventually, when you are a rich country, technology uh, becomes more, more important. But one of the most important reasons why China and the Asian tigers grew so rapidly is that they had an extraordinarily high ratio of working age people to dependents. So that ratio, remember, I said that if that ratio of working age people to dependents gets to 1.7 and above, you enter a potential positive demographic window of opportunity. Of course, you need to you educate um, that uh, working age population. They need to be in good health. They need to have job opportunities. So on the left-hand side on the chart, you can see a country, Mauritius, that is in its demographic dividend. And it is no wonder, therefore, that very recently, Mauritius was one of two African countries that were considered to be high income. The other one is Seychelles. Mauritius was in the meanwhile degraded last year, but it probably will re-enter the high income category again. Whereas Niger, if you look at that population structure, it's going to take several decades, in actual fact, until about 2060, before Niger enters a positive demographic profile, when its working age people to dependents gets to that ratio of 1.7 and above. So, that's one. That's how we think of and how we conceptualize the uh, demographic dividend. I want to go and, and illustrate this by showing you a comparison between three countries. So this is from 1980 with a forecast until the end of the century. On the left hand side is the ratio that I've been speaking about from in this case from one until 2.8. We are now 2030, we're about 2023, we're about there. This is China, this is India, and this is Nigeria, South Africa, um, Africa's uh, country with the largest population. So uh, China peaked in about 2009 at a ratio of 2.7 working age people to dependents. Therefore, the contribution that labor could make to growth was extraordinarily high. China will exit that potential sweet spot at around 2039. At that point, labor will no longer make a positive contribution to growth. That's why people speak of the Chinese, Chinese population getting old before it will get rich. Look at India. This is India. India entered the demographic dividend in about 2006. It will peak at about 2.2 in around 2035 and it will exit the demographic dividend around 2068. India will never grow as rapidly as China because in India, the contribution that labor can make to growth will never get to that massive contribution that we saw in China. And then let's look at Nigeria. Nigeria on the current path only enters the demographic dividend in what is that, 2060, 2060, 2066. And Nigeria will only peak at about 1.9, working age people to dependents, and it will only peak in 2088. Of course, long-term forecasts like this are not very accurate, but population is quite stable and provides us with a good idea of where things will go. So on this trajectory, just looking at the contribution that labor makes to growth, it's quite evident why China grew so rapidly. 
It is also evident that India is growing, but will never grow as rapidly as, as China, but there will be some catch up. But on this forecast, Nigeria only enters its demographic dividend in around 2066. That is a long way into the future and only peaks at relatively low levels. So that's one, that's a very core part of our understanding of the demographic dividend. This is, so what we have done is we have modeled a demographic scenario where we have looked at the levers, particularly rolling out of modern contraception, female empowerment, and so on and so forth, to see how we can accelerate Africa's demographic dividend. Bring the demographic dividend forward in time and make the peak higher, because that means that the contribution that labor makes to economic growth will increase. This is a population pyramid for, in this case, sub-Saharan Africa in 2063, the end point of Agenda 2063, that shows purely the difference that a demographic dividend scenario will make to sub-Saharan Africa's population profile. So it's the same kind of pyramid within the, on the left is a woman, on the right is men, at the bottom are children, and then it is colored by people that, uh, do, that have no education, people that only have primary education, uh, secondary education and tertiary education. Now, what is interesting, after we have modeled a demographic dividend, we have pulled a lot of levers in our mo for a modeling platform, that you can see that the population pyramid of sub-Saharan Africa changes to a much more distinctive bulge around the middle compared to the current path forecast. The current path forecast is on the left and the... Um, uh, um, demographic scenario is on the right hand side. I have not shown you the levers that we have pulled and I've not spoken to, to you about the a model that we are using for the forecasting. On the website, there is a tremendous amount of detail about the modeling platform known as IFS and the levers that we have pulled and how we have uh, modeled uh, this improvement. But that purely the fact that you have less children that you have to provide education for, that you have to roll out health and wash infrastructure for, means that a country has more money than it can spend on educating the children that are at school. So a demographic scenario, advancing Africa's demographic um, uh, dividend, almost automatically translates into higher GDP per capita growth. This is the impact for every African country in Africa by 2043 of GDP per capita compared to the current path forecast. So by 2043, Mauritius will gain 1,079 US dollars just from a more a rapid demographic dividend. Of course, Mauritius comes from a very high level. It's followed by Seychelles, also coming from a very high level, by Eswatini by Egypt, by Equatorial Guinea, by Gabon. And so you can go around and look at the, the additional GDP per capita that comes from a just simply the improvement of the ratio of working age people to dependents. Remember the essential argument. What you are doing is you narrowing your population pyramid from one that looks like the Eiffel Tower with a broad base to one that looks more like the Taj Mahal. It's nice and fat around the middle. Purely changing that relationship means that you have more money to spend on education and health, and it just improves your productivity. These are some of the key recommendations that we make in the um, section that relate to the demographic dividend. We make the point that I hopefully have explained to you that high fertility rates in sub-Saharan Africa constrain development, and that on the continent's current trajectory, we only enter a potential demographic dividend from mid-century, two decades away. You know, there's lots of talk about, South Afri uh, about Africa having such a young population, the future belongs to us. Actually, because we have such a young population, that uh, labor does not only does not really make a contribution to growth until in two decades time by about 2050 onwards. 
So we have to change that if we want to benefit from our rapidly growing population. Something I have not spoken about is the fact that the rest of the world are investing in labor-saving technology. Um, and that reduces the impact of a larger labor pool. So we have to also be concerned about what's going to happen in the long term. So progress to a more rapid demographic transition requires political leadership, education, and media campaigns on the benefits of smaller families, gender equality, the dangers of child marriages, and unequal social and cultural uh, norms. So um, I wanted to explain to you in this first seminar series the importance of demographics. You know, there's an old saying that says demographics is destiny. It's very true. Demographics changes slowly, but it played a huge role in the very rapid growth that we saw in China and in the Asian tigers. It is underestimated in terms of the contribution that demographics makes to economic growth. Simply by um, bringing our demographic dividend forward, remember at the moment, Africa only enters that demographic dividend from 2050 onwards, and uh, uh, getting it to peak at higher rates, which means that your ratio of working age people to dependents is, um, if you can get it to, remember I said China peaked to 2.7. If you can get that, Nigeria is only going to peak at about 1.9, I think. If we can get that to 2.2, 2.3 working age people to dependents, Africa automatically grows more rapidly. Incomes grow more rapidly because simply there are less people, particularly less children, that have to go through school and be uh, educated and invested in basic health care. You can, in actual fact, spend money on empowering and building the education quantity and quality of the people already in the uh, at school. So, um, Pamela, I'm going to, uh, to stop there. I've tried to tell a first story about the importance of demographics for Africa's uh, future. This is often a controversial and a difficult issue, um, but I think what is important to do uh, is to recognize the contribution that um, uh, demographics make to Africa's potential economic growth over long-term horizons. So thank you very much for the opportunity and for partnering with NEPAD on this. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. This really uh, demonstrates the IPS model, you know, demonstrates the support in terms of long-term planning and basically preventative work. And if you look at governments like, you know, Finland, for example, where foresight to work is really, really used, where their ministries, their committees come together to report on their future's work. So we see in developed countries how, how this works and bringing it to the African continent, I think it's very, very crucial and pertinent. And my take is, you know, the ounce of prevention, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So I think it's, it's really, really interesting what the model has to offer. With this now, I would like to introduce the session to um, uh, our discussant for today. And we would like to thank Dr. Janet uh, Badraga. Sorry, Janet, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing up your surname again. It's uh, Bayaruga, a qualified medical doctor and public health expert with over 14 years of experience in international development. Um, with a special focus on human and, and social sectors, Dr. Janet has over, um, over the years provided technical leadership and foresight in development and delivery of key strategic continental policy frameworks um, an initiative geared to strengthening the continent's health care delivery system, food security and nutrition, and also promoting the social well-being and rights of women and children. She currently heads the Human Capital Division at the African Union Development Agency, uh, overseeing health education and gender. And with that, Janet, I invite you to um, you know, discuss what you have taken away from this and to pose your, your concerns and your comments to Jackie. Thank you so much, over to you. Thank you so much, Pamela, and thank you for attempting to pronounce my difficult last name, Biaruhanga. Thank you so much also, uh, Jackie, for very, always uh, very informative um, presentations that uh, kind of like tell a story differently and, 
and quite uh, succinctly and easy. It makes it easy for the ordinary person like me who is not a demographer to understand uh, some of these uh, uh, key elements that are affecting Africa's development and, uh, and uh, that trigger us to think where our focus as AUD and NEPAD should be in terms of programs, in terms of our initiatives. So um, uh, thinking through your presentation and uh, reading through the documentation that was shared with me, um, what I'm going to discuss here is mainly what I think uh, the AUD and NEPAD programs should be um, uh, focusing on. And if not, uh, to consider maybe integrating some of these issues in our programs. So as we reflect on uh, Africa's uh, demographic uh, transition and its implications for development, it is essential to recognize the critical role that health interventions play in supporting countries to achieve the desired demographic transition. Health is fundamental pillar of human capital development and has far reaching effects on population dynamics, economic growth and overall well-being. Africa's current situation in the demographic transition, as uh, Jackie has explained, is characterized by a youthful population that presents both opportunities and challenges. While youth can contribute to innovation and productivity, their sheer numbers constrain resources and hinder progress in income growth, service delivery, education, and environmental sustainability. To address these challenges and harness the potential of Africa's young population, we must prioritize health-related interventions that promote and support the demographic transition. AUD and NEPAD, through our Human Capital and Institutions Development Directorate, for which I am part, um, has a crucial role to play in assisting African countries in achieving the desired demographic transition. To this end, I would like to propose so, uh, several health-related interventions I think the AUD and NEPAD could implement to, su uh, to support African countries. One is comprehensive reproductive health services, whereby we would prioritize the provision of comprehensive reproductive health services, including family planning, maternal and child health and sexual education, access to modern contraceptives, antenatal care, skilled birth attendance and postnatal uh, care are vital in empowering women and enabling them to make informed choices regarding family planning, therefore leading to reduced fertility rates that um, Jackie was mentioning. Strengthening health systems are, are, and working closely with the African governments, the AUD and NEPAD would strengthen the health systems across the continent. And this would include um, improving the infrastructure, increasing healthcare workforce capacity. We have a number of initiatives in that space, enhancing access to essential medicines and promoting universal health coverage. Because a well-functioning healthcare system is essential for delivering quality health services, reducing maternal and child mortality rates, and addressing the burden of communicable and non-communicable diseases that uh, we grapple with on the continent. Another area is investing in primary health care. Prioritizing investments in primary health care is crucial for promoting preventive care, early detection of diseases, and overall population health. So AUD and NEPAD should support African countries in establishing and expanding primary health care facilities, particularly in underserved areas. This could include ensuring access to immunization programs, promoting nutrition and hygiene practices, and implementing disease surveillance systems to address public health challenges effectively. Another area where Human Capital and the Institutions Development Directorate will focus on within AUD and NEPAD is, and we're already doing, is enhancing health education and awareness. We would have to collaborate with the African governments and the education institutions to promote health education and awareness programs. This would include integrating comprehensive sexuality and reproductive health education in schools curricula, raising awareness about the importance of family planning, 
promoting healthy lifestyles and addressing cultural and social norms that may hinder health seeking behavior. Strengthening data systems and research is another area where we can support the development and strengthening of data systems and research capability, which includes analyzing demographic and health data, just like Jackie is uh, showing us today. If we can train more people and have programs within the institutions and within our countries that can be able to um, analyze demographic and health data and form evidence-based uh, policies and interventions that would enable monitoring of progress, identifying areas of need, and evaluating the effectiveness of our health um, programs and policies. So in conclusion, in order to support the African um, uh, Union member states in achieving the desired demographic transition, AUD and NEPAD must prioritize health interventions that address the specific challenges and opportunities presented by Africa's youth population, youthful population, by implementing comprehensive reproductive health services, strengthening healthcare systems, investing in primary health care, promoting health education and awareness, and strengthening data systems and research, we can create an enabling environment for successful demographic transition in Africa. Together with our partners and everybody around this conversation, working collaboratively, we will invest in the health and well-being of Africa's people and by doing so unlock the continent's full potential and pave the way for sustainable development and improved livelihoods. I'd like to end it here and uh, um, give the floor back to you, um, Pamela, uh, to engage in uh, further discussions. And thank you so much also for the opportunity to react to the um, presentation from, um, from Jackie Sue. Thank you very much. Great, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Janet, for, for your, you know, assuring us that you will, you know, place this work at the forefront of Africa's policy, um, influencing policy and development in terms of health sector. And, and you've seen the value of how, you know, this approach on, on demographics and how it impacts us in our long-term planning and specifically on investment in, 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 the, in the health sector in the continent. So thank you very much for that. Jackie, I, I don't know if you want, to, uh, is there anything particular you would like to ask Janet while she is on, on the call, while I just move to any Q and A's that might be posted on the chat. So if, is there something that you would like to ask in Janet's space of work um, that could be helpful in terms of uh, futures, what you see in the model, or what you would like to see from uh, African countries and policymakers in the space. Um, thanks very much, Pamela. I'll uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll again um, just go to um, uh, to the to the website. I was in actual fact responding to one of the listeners who had asked the question about Rwanda. Um, so I just sent, I don't know if it's a, a, a male or female, I sent him or her a link to the Rwanda page because um, we have on the uh, website forecasts for every African country and for every African region and for every regional economic community. There's a lot of data. There's over 4,000 charts on this website and we model every of these sectors on, um, on the future of every geography or country. Africa is hugely diverse. So the one thing that I wanted to um, not respond directly to Janet, because I thought she gave an excellent comment, um, but I wanted to, I, I first want to maybe just make a general point, which is quite important when we speak about demographics and population. Um, every person, every family has the right to children and to have as many as they want to. Um, and one must not, when we engage in demographics, think this is some type of an effort at uh, population control or something. It's not nothing to do with that. It is simply how best to leverage from an economic perspective the potential of demographics. So what we do on the website uh, under the themes is we have spoken today about demographics uh, and we have developed a single integrated scenario that looks both at demographics and at improvements in health and wash, uh, infrastructure, water and sanitation, um, and then we model the impact that that, that has um, on the future. Now, what I did not do when we went to uh, demographics is I did not show you any of the sort of mechanisms behind the levers that we pulled in the model. 
So just sort of for general interest, I'm going to uh, just show that um, there is, um, you can always click on the all charts on the left hand side. Um, and then uh, this is, uh, it's a little bit complicated, but it basically shows you the levers that we pulled within the international futures forecasting platform to emulate a more rapid demographic dividend. So we increase contraceptive use, we lower child mortality, we lowered maternal mortality and so on and so forth. And that is the impact of them and the combined impact is to increase the contribution that labor makes to economic growth. And everything that I was trying to explain to you was that. I started off by showing you um, this chart. Well, I, I actually didn't show you this chart, but I'm going to, sorry, I wanted to show you. Uh, I started by showing you this chart, uh, which was a comparison of uh, China, India, and Nigeria. What I didn't show you was to click on this little button there that shows you the impact of the scenario on Nigeria. You will see the impact of that scenario that I've just shown you on Nigeria is that Nigeria on the current path would have entered its demographic dividend around 2066 in the very aggressive demographic and health scenario. It enters about 10 years earlier. And the second thing is that instead of peaking at a ratio of about 1.9, Nigeria now peaks at a ratio of 2.1. Just that simple um, advancement of Nigeria's demographic dividend. And remember, Nigeria is by a long stretch Africa's country with the largest population, has a huge impact on Nigeria's uh, rate of economic growth and the improvement that that has on GDP per capita, on average incomes. So that's just how you can use the website. It's also to illustrate the power just of demographics. In other seminars on the series, we will take other sectors. Remember that um, I started off when Pamela invited me by uh, going to this uh, thematic portion of the website and indicating that we are during the next few months going to work our way through this entire website. And then in um, uh, September in Addis Ababa, we're going to show what is the combined impact of all of these scenarios on Africa's growth potential. Because Africa has to do all of these things. Demographics is important, but on its own, um, it only makes a contribution to a more rapid, a rapidly growing and a more prosperous Africa. Thanks, uh, uh, Pamela. That was sort of general stuff, I know. No, that's all right, Jackie. Yes, Janet, you would like to add something? Yeah, I, I would like to um, suggest, uh, if possible, the scenarios that are built to help us bring forward the, the, um, the, the demographic dividend at the point at which we, um, we begin to earn the demographic dividend in different countries, uh, what interventions uh, are being suggested there to bring it forward and also to pick uh, higher. Um, if you can share some of the, or, or maybe we just play around with the with what you have on the website, and then we can be able to design programs according to uh, what is being suggested. So I think it's a tool for us. Uh, I would like probably to have, and I would have to have uh, acclimatize also with this, or maybe train a few people on how to um, ex express and articulate these things. So that when we are with the member states and engaging in program development, design and implementation and monitoring and evaluation, we consider these as the things that provide us with the with the with the various choices that we make in terms of what what interventions we should be yeah. undertaking. I know that uh, there is not sufficient time uh, every time to come back to us and give us these talks. But if we can do some recording of these uh, talks and share, uh, and, and I can, I can acclimatize and also use them to train other trainers as we design programs. I think for me, that's something I consider quite useful. If you have that um, idea, Pamela, uh, to work with the church, so we can have, you know, some sort of recorded uh, presentation such as this one. So in my own free time, I can go back because right now I have questions, but. 
there's no sufficient time. Yeah. And, uh, and and so if we can have some of this recorded and, and, and uh, uploaded so that we can be able to navigate the website properly and understand. Thank you so much, Jackie, again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. I just want to indicate that parallel to these sessions that we are hosting with the ISS team and Jackie, we have an MOU as an institution with the, the ISS, and we have parallel to this, do our rolling out trainings to member states and countries. Um, uh, Dr. Jackie has already uh, you know, participated and uh, facilitated many of these workshops. We will continue to do that and reach out to as many country and focal persons uh, in the countries that we, we already have here marked. But this approach is also to take it out far and wide um, also so that we can meet again in September to, you know, um, culminate everything that we have learned and seen uh, over the next two months that we have planned these series. Jackie, I don't know if you want to add on that, but that's my comment to Janet. Thanks. Thanks very much, Pamela. Yes, I just do to uh, put it in practical terms. Um, yesterday, we had a work session with the government of Mali. Now, I know Mali is under under AU sanctions at the moment, um, but uh, we did that separately outside of the, the framework with NEPAD. This year, we are updating our forecasts in Algeria, Senegal, um, Morocco, uh, I'm missing one country, um, or at least miss one country. And we've just done Rwanda and Uganda and so on. So we're taking every country one by one and we present them our forecasts. We invite them to correct the data that we use. Um, very important because maybe they have more um, uh, up-to-date data on, uh, for example, poverty rates. And then we redo the forecast. We adjust the parameters. So um, Janet, uh, thank you very much for the kind words. And I will send you um, some um, writings that we do. I think the, the difference that we, in our approach, is that uh, when you look at the economic contribution that demographics makes to growth, it actually changes your view on demographics quite a lot. You know, um, a growing population means a larger economy, but a growing population does not necessarily mean that incomes are improving. And that's what we want to improve. We want to improve the well-being of ordinary Africans. And uh, if you want to do that, uh, you um, the most one of the most powerful ways to get there is to find ways to reduce family size so that uh, you have not you, that we have fewer kids, but the kids that we have survive because of better health. They go to school and they get better education than they otherwise would have gotten. And that means they are more productive. That means your economy grows more rapidly. And over time, um, it has a huge contribution, but it takes a long time. One of the callers, and of course, one of the uh, questions in the on the chat function was about Rwanda. Rwanda has got some of the best basic health care in Africa for a low income country. Um, and it is like Ethiopia, because it has good basic health care, is going through its demographic transition more rapidly than other countries at similar levels of development. That means over long term horizons, Rwanda and Ethiopia are going to benefit from a higher demographic dividend that comes earlier to those countries. This is a benefit that only comes in 20, 30, 40 years time. It's not something that has a short-term impact, but it is very powerful. Um, the World Bank says that at low levels of development, uh, your demographic, uh, changing your demographic profile can make a, uh, up to a, accounts for up to a third of your economic growth. Uh, that's how powerful it is. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, um, Jackie, when I hear you, you know, we had at AUD and NEP had also have done an introspection. We have asked ourselves how much of time we have with the amount of resources that we have and how much of foresight, you know, can be realistically done. And these approaches on doing, you know, bite-sized um, information dissemination, trying to reach out to, to countries and, and the focal persons that we are currently working on to quickly create something of value that we, they can build on later. So it's a journey that we have started and we're using the existing material and guidance that you know, we would have to create you know, something and build a net rather than from developing you know, everything from scratch. So I think you know, this approach is incremental. We're picking up momentum. And I think the more that know about this work, which is available to actually countries, 
free of charge, as Jackie always says, you know, it's downloadable, the information can be digested and used in their everyday work. So there's a comment from Francis to Janet saying that he uh, agrees with having um, informed policy. For example, what specific data is required for informed policy and what is required for building evaluation capacity for informed policy in Africa. So thank you so much, Francis, for that comment. Um, there are other you know, suggestions, you know, uh, can we get the details present presentation for more reading? We have provided a link on, this, uh, on the chat where you can actually go in, you can plug and play, you know, familiarize yourself with the content that's on the website. And of course, Jackie and his team is uh, available for any specific questions on specific countries that you might have. Um, there's another question from um, Therese. It says, is it one size fit all uh, that every country has to follow a certain way? I don't think the problem is fertility or growing population. Maybe the problem is on the quality health, education, nutrition, et cetera, uh, and not the quantity referring to my country, Tanzania. Uh, so uh, Jackie, would you like to maybe um, comment on that? Yeah, yeah. So um, when you look, so we model education, we're going to come to a seminar on on, on the forecast of education. Uh, now we model two, we model education at every level, uh, apart from pre-primary, we look at primary, lower secondary, upper secondary, tertiary, and we look at the ratio of um, people that go to science and technology, and then we look at so-called STEM education, and we model that. Education lifts all boats, but it takes a long, long time. Just think of it. A child has to go to primary, secondary, tertiary school before he or she, or go vocational, really becomes useful. But what is important uh, about the demographics is how demographics and education interact with one another. We know that one of the, the, the long-term driver of uh, a productive demographic dividend is female education, female empowerment. That really drives um, your demographic dividend. But in the shorter term, the intervention that is the most powerful is rolling out modern contraceptives. Again, it's not an issue of um, controlling population. If you uh, people can have, uh, it, it is a question of being able to give those kids that you have, that they are healthy and to give them the best education that you can, that they are productive and could live a productive life. Um, so um, there's a very strong relationship between education and uh, fertility rates. Um, uh, as I as I as I indicated, but there are also other important drivers. Uh, very often, uh, um, fertility rates are determined by uh, if you are rural or urban. It's determined by your level of income, uh, and so on. People, th so those are very powerful drivers. Um, for example, uh, the Horn of Africa, East Africa, is the most rural region globally. Um, and that is one of the reasons why total fertility rates in that uh, in that region is quite high, because as urban uh, as people become more urban, their fertility rates drop. So you would find that, for example, in Ethiopia, fertility rates in Addis Ababa are quite comparable with, for example, a country like South Africa. But in rural Ethiopia, in actual fact, total fertility rates and in rural DRC and rural Mali and so on, fertility rates are very very high. So. Um, that's a, and, and there are many reasons for that. Um, one of the reasons historically, of course, is that in poor societies, in poor communities, kids often die. Um, and um, as society, as more kids survive, families generally have less children. And also that in um, farming communities, very often parents need children for labor. Uh, there are many, many considerations when considering um, how many kids you want. Our argument simply is that um, if you look historically at the contribution that labor made to economic growth, particularly in China and the Asian tigers, and those are the countries that grew tremendously rapidly in recent history, labor played a huge contribution in their very rapid income growth. And they did that because the ratio of working age people to dependents was high Remember, I said that in the case of China, it peaked at about 
working age people to every one dependent. Um, and they, uh, that means that the contribution that labor could make to economic growth was huge. And that Africa has to emulate that story. It's up to every parent and it's every, to every community to determine how, but it does require us to, to, to talk about uh, demographics. Um, so yeah, sorry, I'm repeating myself, but uh, these, these are very fundamental and important things, but they take time. Population and education are very powerful, but they take a tremendous amount of time to have an impact on uh, productivity and on economic uh, changing uh, economic growth. So you have to start early on both of those. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. I hope that uh, was, um, answered uh, Teresa's question. There's another comment from um, Saida that says, thanks, Jackie. I agree that gender equality will make a huge impact. The challenge, however, is breaking down cultural barriers. But uh, I think you just explained that very <laughs> aptly, that um, the more you know, people are educated, cultural barriers are there for sure, especially in rural Africa. But I think times are changing. I think more, especially women are becoming more you know, um, informed about their, their choices and their options. So I don't know if you wanna add something to that, Jackie, but there's another yes. question from, okay, go ahead. Yeah, there are a number of questions um, that relate to the importance of gender equality. And we actually, we just uh, busy with a project that actually NEPAD is going to join with us where we are going to try and model the impact of gender equality on development. We all know that it's a good thing, but exactly what is its contribution? Um, when you give uh, men and women, children, uh, girls and boys the same education, what difference does that make? Uh, if they are, get the same labor participation, uh, what difference does that make? So that's a very interesting project and more uh, are by the side. Um, so the debate on demographics is changing in Africa. One of the questions is what are, in, to what extent are governments implementing some of your recommendations? So um, the, debate about, uh, um, the, the debate about demographics in Africa is changing. There are some leaders, and I'm, I'm not going to mention them, that take the view that having large families is good for, for, for growth. Yes, large families grow the total size of your economy, but it doesn't grow the quality, the income of your existing population. I, I think those views are entirely misplaced because our work demonstrates unequivocally that um, lower, uh, lower fertility rates increases productivity. There is a certain time, there's a certain point when China, which has benefited from a huge demographic dividend, when its ratio of working age people to dependents will decline. I think China from about 2040, it gets into a negative demographic dividend. And that's, then China will have the problem that Japan has uh, and uh, um, Italy has, and many countries in Europe have. And that is that the size of their labor versus dependence is shrinking. Therefore, what they need to do is they need to use capital or technology to compensate for that if they want the same income growth. But China is going to have a particular problem because it has such, had such a very rapid population uh, bulge, working age bulge. Um, so uh, um, I think that this ratio of of the importance of demographics to economic growth. Uh, that debate, that penny is starting to drop. And in our presentations, very often when we start uh, talking about this, there's quite a surprise. I remember when we did a forecast on Kenya a while ago, and we showed the Kenyans just the impact that a more rapid demographic transition would have on Kenya. There was quite a, it was quite a, it was almost a shock uh, surprise. Um, and, uh, but it is, it's, but it, over a long-term horizon, it's very powerful. Um, so um, then Blessing Chapanda asked the question about uh, the economic model of most African countries. Agriculture-based, does it have an impact on fertility? Yes, it does. Um, African economies are transitioning, um, but uh, generally agriculture in Africa is quite subsistence-based. 
um, poverty levels are very high, and that means fertility rates are very high. And what you find that as people move to urban areas, fertility rates drop quite dramatically. And of course, um, it comes with cultural change and all of those uh, kind of uh, kind of changes as well. Great, thank you, Jackie. We have two other comments. There's another question in your experience, to what extent are governments implementing some of your recommendations? I think I can also answer that we are demonstrating that, and Jackie, you can maybe allude to our example of Mozambique and what we are doing there. But there are two um, comments and questions from um, Ahmed Chan. Even a reasonable, well-trained work workforce needs jobs. China was able to put uh, its labor force into work at a time when low-cost manufacturing uh, sorry, I think I lost it. I lost that comment. Uh, I've Jackie, got it. Are you seeing it? You've got it? Yeah. Oh. Now I've got it. No, very, very interesting and very perceptive comments. Um, this is somebody who knows what he's talking about. Um, it seems to have disappeared on my screen, but maybe <laughs> you can intervene on that. Thanks. So um, um, the world is changing. Um, China grew very rapidly because it became the world's factory um, and it manufactured things. And so let's say that there are three primary sectors in the economy. There's agriculture, manufacturing and services. Um, manufacturing is unique in the sense that manufacturing has very powerful forward and backward links to both agriculture and to services. When a country embarks upon a manufacturing growth path, that's what China did, it changes its entire productive structures of its economy. So China grew very rapidly, not only because of its demographic dividend, but also because of the economic path that it uh, uh, pursued, a manufacturing pathway. India, by contrast, is adopting a services-led growth path. And because, it, because of that, because our services have a less transformative impact on your economy, India will, and because of its lower demographic dividend, India will never grow as rapidly as China, fundamentally. The problem for Africa, and the, um, the comment refers to that, is that on one sense, the manufacturing window of opportunity for Africa is closing. There are many that argue that. It may be true, but the current tensions globally means that manufacturing is relocating. Manufacturing used to go to where the lowest cost was, uh, labor costs, which was China. Today, Africa's labor costs are um, more comparable, but manufacturing is moving to where the market is uh, for a variety of technological reasons. And Africa is the next large global market after India. So manufacturing, Af there is still a window of opportunity. And that window of opportunity um, is narrowing because the rest of the world is investing in labor saving and all kinds of stuff. But uh, there is still a window of opportunity for manufacturing because of the changes in uh, the uh, um, nature of manufacturing. But it is true that um, manufacturing is not as labor intensive as it used to be. Therefore, there is a debate about what is known as industries without smokestacks, you may have heard of it, which is asking the question, if there are certain sectors like agro-processing or tourism that has the same forward and backward transformative linkages that can change the productive structures of your entire economy. I think there's a limit to that, but those are the kind of debates that we need to have. But in the the Africa faces a challenge, and we must not be unequivocal about that, that uh, the extent to which manufacturing will come to Africa, it's almost entirely dependent on if we can uh, get the free trade area to go. To, to, to go. Um, if we don't get the free trade area, the African continental free trade area to uh, establish itself, nobody's going to invest in it. We're going to have a little investment because a manufacturing base wants a large market and only the continental free trade area can give us that market. So there are opportunities, but we need to move. Um, as the, um, as the uh, respondent indicated, uh, that manufacturing window is still open, but it is no longer, it no longer has the transformative effect perhaps that it had in China and the Asian tigers. Great. 
Thank you, Jackie. Just very quickly, we are have about three minutes left to wrap up and close. Uh, a comment from Ruben and a question. He thanks you for the interesting presentation. And he asks, while, while it might seem that interventions on managing fertility is not about controlling population, how could one propose addressing the historical, ethnic, ethical, social, cultural concerns around contemporary neo uh, Methodism, uh, engineering of population in sub Saharan Africa? Uh, especially given the increasing population. And then the second question about approaching this from an engineering linear approach that does not account for factors, including geopolitical um, uh, competition, uncertainty around Africa's own internal socioeconomic. I I'll leave it as that, Jackie, and, and you can maybe just touch on that very briefly. I, I love these questions. This is really <laughs> my, my food. <laughs> I love this kind of stuff. And that's um, what we wanted. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, so um, uh, the forecasting platform that we use is an integrated forecasting platform. Um, and it, it doesn't do linear forecasting. The forecasts are all, in, um, are all dynamic and, and so on. Um, we have, amongst others, uh, I think uh, Ruben refers to the fact that the world is changing. Um, and we are going to let me um, uh, share screen again um, and just show you one thing that I think you will find interesting. Um, Pamela, can you confirm? Oops, let me. Uh, there we are. Can you confirm you can see see my yes, screen? Yes, we can. We can. Okay, so if you, Ruben, if you go to thematics and you go to Africa in the world, there you will find a, a tremendous amount of stuff on how global developments are impacting on Africa. Um, Africa in the world is the section called. Um, and you will find um, all kinds of very interesting and controversial stuff there. Um, but I'm going to just uh, show you this to give you an idea of what we've done. So we have, we have looked at how developments in the rest of the world impact on Africa. We've used two dimensions, the extent of globalization and the extent of sustainability. And we have modeled four worlds, a sustainable world, a divided world, a world at war, and a growth world. And all of these are extensively, there's a, we spent a lot of time on this. I've spoken about this endlessly at many, many meetings and presented these forecasts. The current trajectory of the world is more or less there. And what we did is we looked at what is the impact of these um, scenarios, global scenarios on Africa. Um, so in the sustainable world, that's the size of the world economy, the size of the African economy as a portion of the global economy. GDP per capita in Africa by 2043 is about 44% of the global average. But even by 2043, in the best world, 114 million Africans will still live in extreme poverty. Um, this is more likely where we are headed at the moment. So without going too much into that, we've done a lot of work to, to deal exactly with the question that Ruben is asking. How is this changing world impacting upon Africa's growth prospects? And the short answer to that is to a tremendous extent. I've just written an, uh, a blog um, uh, that you can have a look at. If you go to um, resources and you go to blogs, uh, you will find um, various um, pieces that look, for example, at um, how the world is changing. Peak China, declining US in the future of Africa where we try and look at how global uh, developments are impacting on Africa, particularly the war in Ukraine and its, its fallout. So I'll, I'll stop there, but this is, I love this kind of stuff. <laughs> this, is this is really, really interesting. Uh, just to our French participants, we do apologize for not being able to uh, provide translation this time, but we will definitely improve on that. And hopefully by the next session, we can work on that. Jackie, the last question, I think, to be fair, we'll just take this one. If Africa was to merge under Pan-Africanism, is there hope for earlier development? I really, really am liking these questions. And then we will wrap up and, and, I'll, and we'll close. So um, uh, let me first uh, uh, just put again on this uh, platform, uh, again, the, I just put the, the web, uh, link to the website in again. So we live in a globalized world, a, a world that is many consider sort of a new liberal um, world structure. 
Um, and I think there is a clear recognition that that needs to change. Next year, 2024, uh, the UN will have its summit of the future. And the UN Secretary General, in advance of that, have been publishing a series of policy briefs. There are six. Um, where he speaks about what needs to change to build a future that is fit for our children. Um, and I have some of the policy briefs here because I've been, um, uh, I've been working on this extensively. I can show you this, uh, it's very, very interesting. Um, but he, he basically says that what we need to do is we need to use futures work to do a lot of things. And one of the most interesting uh, policy papers that have been published is the reform of the global financial architecture. As you know, there's just been a summit in France on the same issue. Um, there, there needs to be considerable changes in the global architecture to accommodate not only the rise of China and the relative um, decline of the West, the growth of the rest, as we call it, but to build a future that is uh, sustainable. You know, one of the things that we have not discussed, but if you look long term at Africa's population growth, we at the moment, Africa contributes, I think, three or four percent to global carbon emissions. But because of our rapid population growth uh, towards the uh, about 2070, Africa is a larger carbon emitter than China the United States or any of, of those big countries because of our rapid population growth. Um, so it's another factor to consider. Africa is not responsible for uh, carbon emissions or climate change, but we are a huge contributor. We will become, because of our rapid population growth, a large contributor to, uh, popula to um, carbon emissions. Um, and eventually, while we are the victims of this, we will also suffer the consequences so uh, many considerations in terms of uh, the way in which the global financial and governance architecture needs to change, um, not only to create a space for Africa's uh, development, but also in the interest eventually of a more sustainable world. So thanks, uh, Pamela, for the opportunity to talk at length about stuff that I find very interesting. <laughs> great, great. No, thank you, Jackie. And thank you to all our fantastic audience. I think that, you know, you really, really kept the, the conversation going. We, we did go over, but we did start about a few minutes late. Just to reiterate, you know, the objectives of the Policy Bridge Tank was to serve, uh, to capitalize on the ongoing uh, valuable works that is performed by our African think tanks. And in this case today, you heard from ISS, uh, the researchers, and, and our aim uh, predominantly is to have these platforms that are non-political and exchanging ideas and on development issues. And through this, we can build our own African knowledge. I, I would like to use this opportunity again to thank this fantastic audience, to thank you, uh, Yaki, for your insight and on, on foresight. Dr. Janet, thank you for your excellent contribution and for availing yourself today. And I also want to use this opportunity to thank the team of ISS as well as the team of AUDA NEPAD behind, who have worked behind the scenes. We are really grateful for your support. And for members of the ISS Partnership Forum, the Hans Snedden Foundation, the European Union, the Open Society Foundations and the governments of Denmark, Ireland, the Netherlands, Norway, and Sweden. We want to acknowledge you for making this work possible uh, to the audience and Africa at large. And we look forward for you to staying the cause of this exciting series, as we encourage you to please register now for the second part of the eight part series, which will be next Friday, the 30th of June, at the same time, 1130. And um, before we end, there will be a short survey on the screen. We encourage you to please complete that to help us improve on the work that we are doing. And with these few words, I would like to wish you a wonderful weekend. We hope that we have provided information for you to absorb and to think about and stay safe and, and, and go well. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next week, Friday.